And welcome everyone to Let's Read Ted the Caver. So, um, what I decided to do is, if you remember from one of my, um, I've said this like a couple times now, but especially in like Pokemon Cards Episode 2, I think, my big spiel at the beginning of it, I talked about how I kind of wanted to do <coughs> three things other than gaming on my channel. It was one Pokemon card, slash maybe Yu-Gi-Oh, slash other card, like Magic maybe, if people are interested and ask me to. Um, I'd be fine doing, like, card opening things with that. And then, um, another thing was I wanted to, uh, kind of like a cooking show, you know, like, uh, what is it, Brutal Moose does, except not reviews like that, but, like, you know, just, uh, cook lobster rangu, whatever that is, even though I don't eat fish. <coughs> um, and then finally I wanted to, like, uh, let's read a creepypasta stuff, like, you know, like Mr. Creepypasta, Stuff that I used to listen to him a bunch. Now I don't really anymore. Um, so yeah, I I hope that I don't get in trouble with anyone. With like you know, like I hope Ted the Caver doesn't come after me for this. Cause I know people have read like you know, I'm mostly just gonna be doing uh from the Creepy Pasta Wiki. This case I'm not. This is from the actual Angel Fire page, but um. There was also, um, and then SCP website, I also want to do, like, readings of the SCP, just because, I don't know, maybe someone cares for my voice? I don't, but, yet I still do this, so, maybe a bit. But anyways, um, so yeah, this is copyright to, the, to them. I will put in the description, like, you know, this is just a reading of this, um, I'll put the links to, um, I plan on having, if I can find a royalty-free cave background, like, just like, I GIF or video or something like that. Um, and then, and I have that, of course, in the description. And then I plan on seeing if I can find a cave aesthetic. Otherwise, I'll find some, like, spooky, scary music, I guess, to put to the back of my voice. Very low, though, of course, but... Um, yeah, so... If anyone object, like, if, like, the people who own the copyrights to these things object, um, please don't take down my channel. And please just ask me, like, hey, uh, take this down, because, I don't know, you're damaging my vision with your stupid voice. I will, com I completely understand. But anyways, um, this is just a beginning spiel to this. We'll see how it goes. But I'm bouncing between doing this copy, uh, copy, pay, pasta thing creepypasta thing and then also the cards opening or in this case showing my collection I guess for what I'm dead purposes like most of this is but anyways <clears throat> we're starting to read Ted's caving page in three two one right. um, March 23rd 2001 due to overwhelming number of requests I have received uh, to tell about my discoveries and bizarre experiences in a cave not far from my home, I have created this webpage. I will outline the events that happened to me during the past few months. Beginning with a journey into a familiar cave in December 2000 and ending well, as an actual unit yet. I will use my caving journal as a text to tell about my recent experience. I will give them to you as I experience them in chronological order. I have included photographs that were taken during my many trips into the cave. I have also created a few illustrations to help the reader get a better idea of what things looked like in the cave. Photos are taken by me or one of the few people I went into the cave with. I want to point out a few things before I tell the events. Most of the pictures were taken with a Kodak, disposable type camera. I took a better camera into the cave on one of the two trips. The inside are all original photos and have not been messed with or enhanced, otherwise, other than were noted. We will get my pictures put onto a disc at time of developing so I don't have to scan them later and choose the best digital quality. Two, I will not reveal the names of the other people involved in this experience. If you know me well enough, you probably know them already. And three, I will not reveal the location of the cave to anyone for any reason. So please don't ask. I refuse to be held accountable for anyone's life but my own. I refer to the cave as Mystery Cave that is not its real name. Being as it sounds far-fetched, I agree. I would come to the same conclusion had I had not experienced them. Try to finish this site as soon as possible. Check the date on the main page to see when I've made updates. To protect myself from the people who might want to copy this site, I have included the following. All text on this fall and f all text... And this and following pages are his own words in copyright 2001. Ted. The discovery. Um, now, caving journal, December 30th, 2000. 
B and I decided to get in one more caving trip before the New Year, so we set aside some mystery cave. Not a spectacular cave, but since neither of us have been caving in a while, it has to go into any cave. And a bit of excitement in this trip, uh, there was a small passage in the lower portion of the cave that I wanted to check out to see if it was possible to get past it. It had a small opening, but lots of air blowing out of it. Even though it's way too small to climb through, I had never even checked to see what was inside the passage. Got our gear loaded up and hit the road by 3 p.m. We got to the cave in great time, as B likes to drive fast. We anchored from the usual tree and began to rappel into the cave. I went down first, got my gear together, and while B came down. For it to be many times, we've been caving together for many months now. I was injured in a caving accident a few years ago and was told he would never walk again. My work and perseverance, he not only walks, but can get around very well in caves. He part of the caves might slow him down a bit, but he can make it. He can work through any obstacle until he gets past it. As for the reference to small opening in the cave, there's a saying among cavers, if it blows, it goes. If your passage has a good flow of air, it's probably worth investigating. After we explored all the user pass usual passages, we climbed down to check out the hole. It was all located deep in the cave near the lowest part of the cave. It's on the side of a cave wall about three feet from the floor. To look inside the um, hole, I had to kneel down to duck under an overhang of rock. I used my backup mini mag light and held it inside the hole to see what I could see. I was excited by what I saw. The wall around the hole was just about three to five inches thick. Into a tight passage, the passage opened up a bit just inside the hole. Came back about ten to twelve feet into a small crawl space of that seemed to really open up. Not much we couldn't tell this could be a version passage. Obviously no one's passed through this room, but there could be a way into the passage from the other side. Can you even get to the crawl space, we have to enlarge it opening. Currently it's about the size of my fist. Once we get past the opening, we would have a tight crawl back to where it opened up. It would take some work, we thought we could do it. And we sat down for a few minutes to rest and contemplate a plan of attack. While we sat there in the darkness, we could hear the wind howling from the other side of the passage. It was a low, eerie noise. We could also hear a low rumble from time to time. No big deal, though. And the cave's in the vicinity of a highway that has heavy trucks drive on it. Now, we figured the rumble was affected the trucks resonating through the rocks. We determined that our best plan would be to haul a cordless drill into the cave to drill into the rocks. Then we could take a bullpen and a small sledgehammer and break up the rock. And pretty straightforward, we would widen the hole big enough to squeeze in, see what was on the other side. Uh, efforts to haul all the equipment down the hole would be pain. We hoped it would be worth it. And in the passage, Floyd's tomb after Floyd Collins. It seemed to look like the tight spot where Floyd spent his last miserable days on Earth. Floyd Collins was a caver back in the early 1900s. He got stuck in a tight crawl space and was able to free himself. It's an amazing story that he wrote a book called Trap the Story of Floyd Collins. He has a title. I don't recall the author. Uh, calling a passage Floyd's tomb was not only a tribute to Floyd, but a commentary on the size of the passage. Huh, in retrospect, it's funny how simple I thought it was going to be. A few hours of work and we would be in. Had I known how long it was going to take, I doubt I would have ever even begun the project. When I was going to experience the cave, I never would have returned. We gathered up our gear and headed to the surface. Normally I couldn't care less if I ever came back into this cave. There's nothing special about it, but now I was psyched about getting back and getting through. We even left the cave and we were planning a return trip. This journal entry talks about the climb out of the cave or dinner and a trip back home. Work begins. January 27th to 28th, 2001. B and I were both excited to get back in the cave and get to work. I figured uh, with about four hours of work we could be in and see what was on the other side. We managed to borrow a Dewalt cordless drill to bring with us. We also had masonry bits to drill with, sledgehammers too, to break up the rocks, bullpen sense to drill holes, and a few other tools and we ended up not using. <clears throat> the tools down the works had proved to be a challenge. One of us would climb down the rope, stop at the ledge or a good resting place, and another person would lower the tools. We kept repeating this routine until we got to the bottom of the cave. Drag the tools through the hole, it took about an hour to finally get to work. B took the first turn to the hole. After an hour of exhausting work, we could tell that we were not going to get through in one session. We were training off after we worked ourselves into a sweat, and one would take a break and get some food and water while the one went to work. It didn't work like this. In work, we had to get down on our knees and do our best to avoid smacking our heads on the ceiling. Working in this awkward position, we would drill into the wall around the hole. That was difficult work. We really had to push on the drill, and it was slow progress. Uh, and then we interested, inserted the bullpen into the hole and hammered on it until the rock broke up. And then we would repeat the process. To give you an idea of how slow it went, the size of rock that would break off was about fingernail size. We have a large piece, of, uh, large piece about one third of the size of my palm, it was cause for celebration. From time to time, for variety, we would just wail on a cold chisel with a five pound sledge. So, progress. The problem with the sledge was it couldn't take a good swing because of the tight quarters. 
We spent many hours and several trips uh, working the hole. We never did find a better technique for watering the hole. The um, drill bullpen hammer got the best result for our efforts. Uh, we came up with some crazy ideas for breaking up the rock, everything from TNT, never seriously considered. I had generated to the mouth of the cave and running an extension cord down to a jackhammer. In that way, using liquid nitrogen to freeze the rock and make it more brittle. After a couple hours of hard work, we realized that our limiting factor was going to be... It was about then that our first battery met an abrupt death. We had a second battery, so we swapped them out. The battery lasts a little longer because we hammered and just a little more... Often and a little longer each time. Finally, after about three more hours of drudgery, the second battery died and we called it a night. Woo. We could tell that we had done some work in the cave, but it was not much. Ever since we got in the cave, we sat back, both of us, to take a break. Nice to check out the results of our hard work, then we noticed the howling again. We were a little louder than the last time we were there. Just figured the wind was blowing in a little strong outside. What we could not figure out was a rumbling. It, too, seemed to be louder and more frequent. This time we could not attribute the noise to the trucks. The road the trucks drove on was not very busy to begin with. And at that time of night, it should be dead. If the rumbling continued, we came from deep within the passage. B City would ask some veteran cavers what could be causing the noise. We didn't spend a long time admiring our work. We still had to haul the gear up and out of the cave. Actually, we left some of it in the cave. So difficult work. What made it worse was that we were both exhausted. No plan was to be done with this cave and in a couple of the caves in the area the next day. We decided to crash at a nearby motel, charge up the drill batteries, and go back to Mystery Cave. A journal goes in on at length about the night after we left the cave. We got our room, dinner was excellent, and sleep good despite the fact I was exhausted, etc. We both slept in, so we got a late start back in the cave. Second day working in the cave went about the same as the first. We worked until both batteries were dead again, still not even close to getting through. The howling room will continue as the day before. On caving. Before I continue with the next journal entry, I thought it would be helpful to the reader to explain a little bit about caving and about the atmosphere in the cave. As I reread and think about my description of the cave, I notice that much of the language I use in my caving journal and the descriptions, or lack thereof, assume that the reader has a knowledge of caving what it was like inside a cave. In other words, I write my journals for me. I will take this time to give a more detailed description of the cave, tell about what it was like while we worked in the cave, and I will summarize our feelings up to this point. The cave was discovered several decades ago when construction the area and earth its entrance. At that time to the present has been visited by mostly locals in the areas and avid cavers in the region. Beer cans can be found intermittently in the cave, mostly in the upper half. The cave was first entered by beautiful dust, graffiti, vandals, pigeons, and regular uses of diminished its appeal. There's still places in the cave where small formations remain undisturbed as a reminder of what the rest of the cave used to look like. To enter the cave, one must have a good length of rope in order to rappel down into the rock. Nearby tree serves as a good anchor point. Once the rope is tied to the tree, about 20 feet away from a small cliff, it can be tossed over the edge of the cliff to a small ledge 15 feet below. Cavers can then descend the short distance to the entrance. Once inside the cave, artificial light must be used. My so the choice is battery-operated helmet-mounted light, known as a tag light. Safe caving calls for at least two sources of backup lighting. I backup lighting have a mini-mag light mounted to my helmet and another helmet mounted light in my pack, which I always carry with me. I also have glow sticks that I carry with me. I consider a good source of backup light, but by some, they're good to use for taking lunch breaks, and they could be used to get out of a cave if the other sources fail. After a short climb over the large rocks, that caver comes to a large pit. The move is used to reach the bottom of the pit. The drop is only 50 feet or so, but it's not free hanging. In other words, you can't slide straight down the rope, which is preferable. You have to sneak your way around sharp rocks as you descend. The descent is made more difficult for the same reason. The pit varies in diameter from about 10 feet to 3 or 4 in a few places. It was aligned with sharp white rocks called popcorn. Let me correct that. It used to be white, but now it's covered with dust and dirt that was kicked down from above by years of caving. The popcorn makes it painful to brush against the side of the pit. My choice of uh, clothing is Levi's, t-shirt, gloves, and knee pads. I usually leave the cave with a few scrapes, but at least I'm comfortable while climbing around inside. There is a stable year round. It feels cool in the summer and warm in the winter. We have gone on, on freezing days and 10 feet in the cave is warm enough that coats are not needed. It's a good temperature to work in, as we learned. For this size drop, I usually use a figure eight descending device. For the climb up, I attach myself to the rope using a pencil sender, but uh, I climb up on my own without using the device. It is there merely as a safety attachment in case I slip. Cave is his own message of getting down and up. At the bottom of the drop, the caver gets to do some crawling for a while. There is a small room about six by six feet at the bottom that gives the caver a spot to leave his harness and descending ascending gear. There is no more steep drops on, it's not needed, and will only get in the way. Once the caver gets down to the 6x6 six six room, he can take a break under the ledge while the rest of the party comes down. Then, he must drop to his knees to negotiate a 10-foot-long passage that's only a few feet high. 
Through so the knee pads coming in handy, the floor is covered with so soft dirt intermingled with bits of broken rock from above. The layer of dirt does nothing to soften the blow to the hands and knees as the caver works down the crawl space. As a, result, as a reward at the end of the crawl, he has to drop to his belly and scoot under a tight squeeze. Not really tight, but only low enough to make the caver scoot along in the dirt. Once the caver gets to the other side of the squeeze, there are a few feet of crawl space and the cave opens up enough to stand. The rest of the cave, the caver can stand or at least stoop. The cave splits off into several passages at this point. Two routes wind around rocks and crevasses and come to abrupt dead ends. Another two lead to small pools of water. Each route is fun to explore. It will lead on for 100 feet or so and it gradually goes down. So most of the time the caver can walk up right in the passage. Other times he will have to climb over large boulders, occasionally crawl on hands and knees. Water is a common occurrence in caves. I've been told that one of the local residents was one of the first people in the cave and his cousin dove in the pools using scuba deer, scuba gear. He says the cave can do down a couple of hundred feet under the water. What they were hoping for and what happens frequently is the passage comes up somewhere else with virgin cave patches to explore. Fortunately, I don't possess the knowledge to give more detail about the types of rocks in the cave. Drilling, we would have some parts that are easier to drill than others. And there are different colors in the rocks referred to the photos taken in the cave. It's the best I can describe but the makeup of the cave. At the point, the cave splits into four roots. Um... And the two passages at dead end are to the immediate left of the cave, uh, to the caver. And straight ahead and to the right of the passage that leads to the pools of water. And the passage on the right is the largest of the four. The arched opening rises nearly ten feet in there, ending a mere foot below the cave ceiling. As the caver enters the passage, the ceiling gradually lowers until it's about six feet high. Continues at the same height for about th for the third forty feet. That passage travels in a continuous direction. This section of the cave resembles a hard rock mine. And its arch nearly perfect and the floor fat and flat and easy to work walk on. Dealer. It's easy to picture rusty mine cars on rail lines and dust covered miners with blistered hands gripping dull picks. Pseudo mine comes to an end and the cave is once again forced to drop on hands and knees and get reacquainted with the floor of the cave. Some of the crawl lasts about 20 feet. The floor is sloping gently down for the first half of the crawl. It's fairly steep and slippery. Able-bodied cavers can still climb carefully down the slippery slope. When I go with B, I carry then the rope that we use to get down to this point. I usually need to tie another short length of rope to the first rope to make sure you can use it to reach the bottom. The crawl lasts a few feet beyond the bottom of the slide over the next 10 to 12 feet. Caver slowly begins to regain the standing position. <coughs> so walking a few feet and climbing down a short drop off, the caver arrives at a small level area which has a passage leading down immediately to the left. And the passage ends 75 feet later at one of the small bodies of water. To the right is a rock wall, straight ahead is an indentation in the wall which goes back about 3 feet. The wall at the rear then is a small hole about the size of a softball. At the end of the hole, the caver ducks near an overhang and kneels upon the rock. Um, the uh, rise above the floor by a few inches. By the time the cave reaches this point, he's either warm or sweating, and the first thing he knows is a cool breeze blowing out of the hole. My recognition of this hole as a potential doorway to the unexplored portion of the cave that ultimately led to this telling my experience. As has been tradition for all the years I've been caving, the party reaches a point in the cave, usually at the deepest part of the cave, all lights are extinguished. Complete blackness fills the eyes for a moment, the individual caver strains eye muscles, focusing in and out with the expectation of catching a crumble light somewhere in the fall tonight. For several few time moments, the caver turns his head at the sound, sound of the caver only to have the other senses return and then heighten. As sounds, smells, and feelings that have been overlooked to this point come bracing the caver in perfect detail. The pain of the own behind sitting on the cave floor, <clears throat> the smell of dust, sweat, and guano, the sound of modern materials shifting, on age-old rock, as cavers attempt to find comfort on the solid foundation. And if your caver's mind uh, this time is what if? The person had to climb out of the cave with no light. Would he make it? Would he find all the turns and bends which got him to this place? If not, would a rescue party find him in time? The depths of the darkness recognizes time as something that is rarely experienced outside a cave. The first time cavers erroneously declare that they have to hold their hands to, um, within two or three inch of their face before they can see it. Truth is a human eye is incapable of seeing in the absence of light. If you know not hear something coming towards them, they would feel it before they saw it. Complete and total dark. This is a great way to remind people to take a back backup lighting. As we proceeded to uh, work in the cave, we developed the system pretty early and little changed in the succeeding trips. This time in the cave, B took first ship shift 
uh, chipping away at the opening, and after about a half hour, you needed a break, so I took over. He told me it would work best, and I continued doing the same. We would try new things from time to time, use new muscles, and usually stuck to the same method. You used the amazing bit and pressed on the drill as hard as you could and drill out a hole in the rock. Safety glass and dust masks were worn while working. Then we insert the bill pin and hammer it into the rock and break out small chunks of the cave. Drill another hole and repeat the process. Occasionally the drill would hit a soft spot rock and that step would be shortened. It would work until we became too tired to continue then B and I would trade. One of us was working, the other would remain in the darkness and either eat or drink or just lay down on the cave floor, padded by rope bags. Just a few rotations, we were tired enough to catch a nap while taking our break. The light we used was a helmet light on the head of the worker. At this point towards the hole, the resting person was left mostly in the dark. The welcome benefit since the resting person was usually, well, resting. Our rest break was also a chance to cool down a bit, which shouldn't take long in the cooler temperature of the cave. Fortunately, the temperature of the cave allowed us to work pretty hard and not overheat much. When I frequently to looked in the hole at the I uh, remember that I frequently looked and the hole and thought, Hey, it's big enough, I think, and squeezed through only to be disappointed in my attempt. <laughs> I mean, even at the first attempt and failure, I knew that I would keep working the hole until I got through. Despite the fact that I knew it would take many more hours of hard work, it became an obsession of mine. I tried to get out to the cave and work as often as I could. I hoped that the passage led to a larger, undiscovered cave that we would be the first ones to enter. So the explorer me wanted to find a new frontier there in the cave. He is such an avid, avid, car, avid caver. He's motivated by the same desire to find a new unexplored cave. And if I was not all what I expected. By the way, I'm going to have to take a drink of water between each of these. Because these last few pages have been kind of tearing up my throat. February 10th, 2001. Scarcely two weeks had gone by and already we were on our way back out to work in the cave. We met, we had uh, become obsessed with the idea of getting through the passage. That might be a sign of how exciting our lives really are. Uh, we think there's going to be something great beyond the passage, which is like the being first humans to face the planet to set foot in a virgin part of the cave. We found a hidden treasure that would be fine with us. We got a late start and drove part of the way into the cave in the dark. Tell people that I go caving at night, they wonder why. I don't stop to think. It's always night once you're inside the cave. All the way out to Mystery Cave, we talked about new ideas to speed up our work. He also told me he talked to some cave of friends as they, of his. He had an explanation about the roaming noise. He thought it might be the sound of water deep within the cave, possibly a waterfall. I couldn't really explain why the noise seemed to come and go. Yeah, 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 it's just one more reason to get through so we can solve the mystery. This trip we took B's dog Whip. She's a Jack Russell Terrier who was not at all concerned about taking the dog in the cave. We had taken her before. She answers the call of nature before we go in and then waits until we get out again. Also, she is well behaved inside the cave. We simply had to lower her via custom made harness until she reached the bottom of the main drop. Then she negotiated the rest on her own. She loves to explore but won't go out of her sight. And then the light attached to her, so she has to wait for us. Another reason I didn't mind bringing Whip along was because we planned on putting her into the small and see how far into the basket she would go. It might give us an idea of what's on the side, but you know there's a drop off that we couldn't see. The dog would turn around and come right back out. So uh, we might have to do some work on the wall before even the dog could get through. So by working in the dark of the night, we were able to rig up and get down pretty quickly. We didn't take as many tools as last time. Plus, we left some in the hole so we wouldn't have to haul them out and back in again. I managed to get two more batteries for the drill for a total of four. So, a few more masonry and drill bits. Even with the dog, we made a good time getting down. Something bizarre happened that I can't quite explain. The dog began exploring as soon as we let her off the rope. She was in hog heaven, sniffing down around around her feet. She would run from one person to another, so we made her way back to the work site. At the point in the cave splits into four passages, the dog seems to run out of juice. She just stuck right by either B or me. It seemed kind of odd. As we progressed further into the cave, she would only stay by B. She seemed edgy. Like she saw something she didn't like. So we brushed a short drop off before the hole. She stopped and would only come further after we coaxed her. Her and her back stood on end. Finally, as we got within 20 feet of the hole, she began to whimper and hide behind B. She was tucked between her legs and she was cowering down on the ground. Strange. I've seen her scare off with dogs twice her size, but now she acts as if Satan himself was lurking in the darkness. It must be have been animals that use the cave as a home and whip smelled their scent. Too bad I upset her because there was no way she was going to the passage. 
We decided that with this new development, the Nervous Dog, one of us would work with the other was stay with the dog a few feet away from where we normally rested. Got right back into a routine of drilling, hammering, etc. Through extra supply of batteries, we were able to really push hard on the drill. I have to worry about using up the batteries. This did not make our work any easier, but it did speed things up a bit. Progress was still slow. I really didn't mind, though. Journey goes on for a while, but the progress we were making, the time we worked with did not move. She just laid there in the rope bags, shivering. She remembered from time to time, one thing I didn't think about at the time was that she would not take her eyes off the hole. We should have been more observant of this intuitive animal. We were on a fourth battery when the second bizarre thing happened to us. B was working. He had just finished drilling the hole and was getting ready to hammer the bullpen when he stopped working and looked in the hole. King Mac, almost asleep and hardly paying attention to B, light by his side to limit the working area. I could see in the area glow a puzzled, intense look on his face. No I mean, shook his head. I asked him what it was up. He said that he swore he just heard a strange noise emanating from the hole. He said it sounded like rock sliding on rock. Sort of a grinding sound. I assumed his ears were just ringing from the drill. He didn't wear any earplugs this trip. <clears throat> Jimmy, you heard what he said he heard. I didn't have an explanation, so I went back to dozing. He sat in the quiet of the cave for a long time before he resumed work. So he wouldn't stop from time to time and just listen. But he's very grounded and not one to pursue some imaginary sound. We've heard, heard something, but I'm not too concerned about what it was. Soon we'll figure it out once we get through the passage. But I asked another hour or so. We were sitting around talking about progress when I decided to see if I could get my head through the hole. My head easily fit, but there's no way my shoulders were going in. As the end of the how close we were, I noticed something that be overlooked. The wind had stopped. All the time I've been in the cave, I always felt the wind blowing. Last time we were out working in the cave, the wind was blowing worse than ever. You really remember the breeze cooling us off, but now nothing. So you did not know when it stopped, the only thing it ceased too. Bizarre. The you know, cave was becoming mysterious. Talked for a long time in the dark of the cave. We debated what could possibly be causing these unusual events to occur. I think part of the reason we were sitting in the dark was because we were both too hammered to move. We could come up with a new reasonable explanation for the strange thing happening in the cave. After sitting for at least half an hour, we slowly load up our gear and started for the surface. Whip couldn't have been happy to get out of there. So again, we asked some of the tools in the cave, just put them in the hole. I'll be able to use the cave to worry about, plus we were too care tired to care. We made a lot of progress to this trip. It helps to have extra batteries. We still have a long way to go, but it sure is nice to see how far we've come. The journal entry talks about climbing out of the cave, getting a room in a motel, and crashing. We are beat. So in retrospect, I can't believe how casual we were about everything that happened in the cave. At the time, the only thing we could think about was getting to the passage. Everything else was just a minor distraction. I do recall thinking that it would be nice to get in and see how the mechanics of the cave worked, where the wind was coming from, making noise, etc. Now, weeks later, I think of my ignorance and naivety and shiver. Noises. March 3rd to 4th, 2001. It took us three weeks before we got back out to Mystery Cave again. Areas have changed a bit since we first started the project. In the beginning, we looked at the whole thing as a fun adventure. Since the last trip, uh, we found ourselves taking a more serious approach. On the drive out this time, our conversation was a little more subdued than before. We hadn't talked much since last trip, not for any reason, but scheduling conflicts. <coughs> uh, discussing ways of getting to the passage, we found ourselves talking about rational explanations for what had happened. Neither one of us had any ideas that would explain the unusual occurrences we experienced on the last trip. We were amused to find out that neither one of us had talked much on the last trip to other people. This is a complete reversal from other trips. It's been fun to report to friends and family about our progress. It is always fun to tell people about the tight squeeze we were going to have to get through in the past. And most people have little desire to voluntarily subject themselves to incredibly tight places. Actually, neither do I, but I will do it in order to get to the other side. Good motivation. We left town early in the afternoon to beat traffic. We go around the, what time we finally got the cave. Like I said, the mood was subdued. We got rigged up and started down. <coughs> Obviously, B left the dog home this time. We took essentially the same gear as last time. We left some of the tools in the hole to save our backs, the agony of hauling the extra weight. Even with the gear, we got down in good time. We really have a good system for getting up and down. Oh, there was only one minor mishap this trip. B scraped his arm on the descent. Not bad, really bad. Fortunately, he waited until we got all the way to the hole to patch it up. It was just a superficial cut. While I was getting the wound cleaned up, I started working. We both took notes that the breeze was back and the rumbling present. Four fresh batteries and four, maybe three and a half fresh arms. I had high hopes this would be the day. It started out pretty slow. 
When you first started working on the hole, the thickness is about three inches. We have larger hole, the thickness has increased. Well, our progress becomes slower. Still, we continue with as much energy as we could put into the work. Hole is big enough, at least for me, to uh, put the hammer into the hole for reference and put the camera into the hole. Take a picture of Floyd's tomb. And it's difficult uh, to get the exact feel of the tomb, but the lowest point near the back of the picture is about seven inches high. It's about twenty to twenty-four inches. The hammer is a small, five-pound sledge. Uh, it's been nice to see the pile of broken rock below the hole get bigger and bigger. Most of realized that we're just going to have to put it in a certain amount of work in order to get through, so we just get down to business. I need to talk watch while we work, since one of us is making a lot of noise with drill a hammer. Break times are used to chat momentarily about whatever topic pops into mind. And the break takes place whenever the guy that's working decides to switch roles. We both put in some pretty good work sessions. I have a little more stamina than B, but he gets just as much done in a short amount of time due to his upper body strength. So so with the small victories we can along the way. Whenever a section that we're working on crumbles, we cheer. On every occasion that a fist sized rock falls from the entrance, we whoop and holler. It's one small chunk of earth that no longer separates us from whatever lies on the other side. So however the fantasy that there's a hidden entrance to the side of the passage, and years ago Spanish explorers hid their treasures in the cave and sealed up the entrance. And has remained untouched until we find it. Here's a more realistic, although more mundane theory. Figures there's more cave on the other side. We'll see who's right. This trip out, I wanted to see if we could speed up the work by using larger masonry bits. Purchased some good sized ones at the arbor store at a good sized price. One was larger in diameter than all the rest, so those were smaller around but longer. And I pretty much concluded that the big one might be too big, and I was right. Tried to get into the rocks, but progress was real slow. I tried pushing for all we were worth, and all we got was side. We just created too much friction area for our strength. We worked with a hammer drill, but we didn't have one. <clears throat> longer bit worked fine with our drill. We relied on it for most of the work we did this trip. I thought we were gonna um, be out one bit in a drill in my hand. We were going to be out one bit in a drill in my hand when the bit broke off toward my own end. Switching as hard as I could on the drill with a bit a few inches of wall when it snapped. They ran the drill through the wall from pushing so hard. We were able to retrieve the bit and keep using it minus a couple inches. It worked, still worked great. Only once in a great while to resort to hammer and chisel work was proceeding as normal till about the time we were on the fourth battery. Leaning down and working the drill slowly into the wall at the time I had my earplugs in, my safety glasses on, and I was lost in my own thoughts. Leaning over the screw of the drill wearing down the rock, I heard a strange noise. It was loud. I could hear over the drill noise of the drill even though I had earplugs in. I really thought it was just a drill bit doing its job in the cave. I would frequently complain by screeching and whining. He forced into the wall, but this was different. We had several full seconds to comprehend when it was coming from inside the hole and not the bit. Not drilling yanked my earplugs out just in time to hear the most terrible scream I've ever heard trail off and echo into the darkness of the cavern. I stared wide eyed at the hole. For several minutes I didn't move nor did I breathe. I look at B moments early, he had been lying in the rope bag catching a nap, now was standing upright, mouth open with a look of concern on his face. I turned and looked in the hole again, half expecting to see a demon face staring back at me. Nothing was different in Floyd's tomb. I fixed my gaze on the back of the squeeze where the limits of my light reached. There was no motion. Only darkness beyond the reaches of my light. In the complete silence that followed, I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. No other sound could be heard in the cave. Suddenly, I heard a scraping noise behind me and straightened up. I nearly knocked myself out, hitting my head on the overhang. Just be moving to turn on his light, but I was so wide, I nearly sent me to my grave. B spoke and I again I jumped. He said to get some rocks and put them in the hole. And that whatever animal made that noise might be able to get through the hole. I immediately grabbed a few rocks and hoisted them through the opening. And then I said, Chammer, I slid the rock as far back in the tunnel as I could reach. Green wall between us and the other side. Since the screen is so small, it didn't take long. The entire time I was doing this, however, I was thinking that the noise certainly did not come from an animal. I know B really thought it was, or if he was just trying to convince himself. Say anything to him about what I thought. Time it happens to the Ryan's journal entry two days later, I have tried to come up with some possible source for such a noise. The guy would say it sounded like a cross between a man screaming in fear and a cougar screaming in pain. <coughs> it came from the hole and was roughly 100 feet away. The horrific noise reverberated through the cave through my ear. BS made the scream last at 8 to 7 seconds. It was about 5 seconds, 3 seconds while I was drilling. When I asked seconds to uh, drop the drill and yank the earplugs and half second of sheer terror. We'll tell how much time passes when you're listening to a solo from the depths of Hades. After I filled the uh, back of the passage with rocks, we just sat there listening to silence. We're breathing a lot more rapid than usual. Neither of us spoke for quite some time. Finally, be suggested we get back to work. Keep an eye out for movement in the hole. 
Put a line in the passage that shined in the back of Floyd's tomb. And it was only at this point that I realized the wind, had, um, <clears throat> the wind had stopped again and was rumbling and could no longer be heard. I'm nervous would be an understatement. I didn't say anything to B nor him to me. Back to the drilling. B took over the work, which is fine with me. I wasn't exactly worn out, but I didn't mind being further from the hole. B would stop from time to time and listen. I just sat watching with my light on. I wasn't close to the entrance of the hole, but I still found myself looking behind me down the passage to the still water. Every time my light would cast some unusual shadow, my heart would jump. My imagination was running wild. Ali B seemed to be less concerned about the strange noise than me. After a short time, he seemed to be focused entirely on getting through the passage. I was still straining, listening above the sound of the drill. I heard nothing but the now familiar sound of carbide on stone. Not only in the possible scenarios which might play out on the other side of the passage, I found myself strangely getting somewhat excited again by getting through. It must it might have been a fatigue thing stole my mind, or the thought of something valuable on the other side. <coughs> I was broken when B let out a yell, possibly a cuss word. The drill battery is dying, but he hadn't quite broken off a large roller section he was working on. He set the useless drill aside and picked up a hammer and bullpen. He started willing away at the holes created by the bit. Near the tensile minutes of hammering, he sat back against the rock, sweating and nearly out of breath. The bullpen was still protruding from the cave wall. He held the hammer toward me, inviting me to take a few swings. I held up my arm, shook my head. I've been ready to exit the cave for quite a while now. He didn't press the issue. I was speaking, we both started gathering the gear we were going to take out. Together, we snatched from the tools in the passage. It was the first to start towards the top of the cave. Several times, I had to stop him when for being not because he was moving so. I was just more than eager to get out. A few times have I felt better than that night, stepping out of the chilly night air. Um, my journal talks about the rest of the evening, or dinner, or decision to get a motel, and come back the next day. Any discussion of strange sounds we had heard, another mediocre night's sleep. I cannot believe that we were so willing to get right back in the cave after hearing the scream. Part of the reason I went along with Adio is because B seemed so indifferent to any possible dangers. We were an animal, which I did not believe, but I could offer no better explanation. Were we possibly putting ourselves in harm's way? In retrospect, I still have difficulty in understanding your thought process at the time. Just too eager to discover virgin cave passages. I think it can be summed up with one word, testosterone. Now you're 13th. It's amazing what a couple good meals and a little sleep can do for someone's attitude. <coughs> Even though we still have memories of strange noise fresh in our minds, <coughs> we relit our fire of enthusiasm. The other side of the passage seems so close. Sure, this would be the day. We got to the cave, started to work our way down to the hole. Back in the dark of the cave, we brought back the memories of the night below before. Uh, side of the circle of rock and wind by and headlamps. Smell the dirt in the air, the sound we made as we crawled around the rock. And once we reached the entrance of the voice, soon however, we were once again ready to blaze a trail leading to an undiscovered part of the cave. You know the presence of breeze blowing in the hole and the rumbling. The bullpen sticking in the hole was an obvious sign of where we need to begin the work for today. B took over where he left off the day before. I took a residence in the same spot I occupied the night before. I was already well rested and wanted to start working. B was making the armor sing with each blow. In two or three minutes, he let a cherry turn to reveal a handful of rock. He used to be attached to the cave. He was breathing heavy, but with a big smile on his face. So did I. For the first time, the strange noise had been forgotten, and the vision of success captured her attention. The lower left-hand corner of the hole had been giving us grief because of the thickness of the wall at that point. Now, if we could just remove that corner, we might be able to make our way uh, be on our way inside. We now held in its hand the crumbled remnants of the corner. Simon consumed us as we examined the hole. I took the hammer and pounded away at the surface of the hole. It was to remove the jagged edges that would take their toll on my skin. Size looked right, not the moment we had been working for. <coughs> I cautiously approached the entrance to Floyd's um, tomb. I showed the um, best way to enter the small hole. I just placed one arm over my head, turned my head sideways, slowly worked my way in. I soon determined that this was not going to work. The hole was small. I was going to make it into without wetting the hole any more out. I would be going to have to put both arms over my head in a diving position, turn my head sideways, and slip into the tomb. When the entrance was the limiting factor that I was in was sufficient. The arms overhead position fled my shoulder blades out. There's still room to get in. Plus, the arms overhead gave me the best squeeze side to side. When I turned to the string to the hole, I stood on my feet, bent over to get level with the entrance. My knees were bent and the position was uncomfortable, sort of a semi-squatting position. Bent at the waist with the arms overhead. 
Plus, I have to slightly turn my upper torso to the left in a counterclockwise rotation to negotiate the angle of the entrance. Notice in the last photo that the entrance generally slopes up to the right. I got my arms through the entrance with minor scrapes. Next came my head. So by the way, there are pictures with this thing, but I'm not going to show them just because that is pushing the limits of copyright, I'm sure. Next came my head. By keeping it turned sideways, I was able to get it in for the most part up to my shoulders. In my shoulders, I could feel the rocks touching all around my shoulders and chest. That was not stopping me, but it was definitely scraping many surfaces of my body. So I just pushed through, keeping in mind that I was going to have to come back out eventually. It was not too bad, and I was in. Well, my upper body was in. At least I could get a good idea what the tomb was going to be like. Uh, once inside the tomb, I had a few inches all around me in which to position my body. This is the largest part of the passage, and was conveniently located right at the beginning of the crawl. Give me a little room to get positioned to crawl further into the passage. Inside the tomb gave me a whole new outlook of what it was going to be like to crawl through. You know, this was the largest part of the crawl, it was still small. I couldn't move my head around freely, but every direction I turned, I was staring at a wall of solid rock. So to me, my voice sounded muffled like I was talking to a small box. It's not chest on the passage floor, but the rocks were uncomfortable. I turned my head to look further ahead, but couldn't see the past the wall of rocks I had built the day before. So this towards the passage was closer now, and appeared even nearer. Rower. I didn't know if I could squeeze through or not. I knew it would be close. I crawled further in the passage first, so I had to work to get some of the loose rocks that were lying on the passage floor out of my way. It's so when you find out that most of the rocks that looked loose were actually attached to the floor. I was hoping that I'd be able to just skate them out of the way. I had to push the sledgehammer into the passage before me. At this point, I used it um, to push the rock wall we had made for the back to the passage. Then I dragged the sledge back and forth across the floor to move any loose rocks or break up the solid ones. Sliding the hammer into the squeeze, I determined that the nearest part of the squeeze was about 7 inches high. I figured we would have to do some work before I could slip through. The next time I had my head in the passage, we was just kicking back, listening to my scripture and progress reports. At some point, he snapped the photo shown above. Thanks, B. <clears throat> Up to this point, the size of the passage was not too big of a deal. And it was in an incredibly small passage, but only my upper body was in. It was the largest part of the passage, and my arms could be freely. That was pretty calm. Then it was time for a push. I set the side chamber up as far as I could reach. Since my body filled the entrance, I could not slip the tool out. It was easy to push ahead. In order to rotate my hips to the proper angle to enter the hole, I had to lean my upper body on my forearms, use my feet to climb the wall outside the hole, and slowly crawl into the hole. And it's barely fit. Once the back clear, once they cleared the passage, um, I could relax a bit and get in position to work towards the squeeze. So I had to try the one arm forward technique uh, to get through. It was so narrow that whatever position I started with, I have to stay with through the entire length. There was just no room to move around or change positions. I also had to turn my head one way or another and keep in the same position. This crawl was tight. <coughs> Moving forward, this part of the passage relatively easily. Use my forward arm, my left arm to pull, and then my other arm to push. At the same time, I would wiggle my body, trying to arch as much as I could to keep my chest off the rocks. I tried both ways in German, then I would turn my head to the right. I felt the most comfortable. I began to learn things as I went. I determined that a small flashlight in one hand would be nice, and then I could shine in ahead and get a bit of what I was about to crawl over. It was a difficult move because I had to look overhead since my head was turned. Immediately obvious, we were going to have to do some more work removing rocks from the passage floor. As I moved along the surface, I was constantly scraping my chest and rocks. Your sharp end was painful. Occasionally, I would cause a rock to slide along under my chest and actually wedge me between it and the top of the passage. I had to back up and try to move the rock with the side of my cheek. Um, using the same motion with my head or back uh, way out, move and way out and move with my forward hand. My little trip in the passage represented a major milestone in my caving career. Here, me, I did not feel overly comfortable going through tight spaces. This squeeze at the beginning of the cave was an obstacle to overcome. By pushing myself and forcing myself from the narrow passages, I had become much calmer about tight spaces. My passage represented a new benchmark in small places. I had not been faced with anything this small. I don't remember having to take off my helmet before now, with this passage was mandatory. Before, not only do I have to take off my helmet, but I have to turn my head to the side in order to fit. Journey into the tomb went like this. After I uh, twisted my hips in the passage, I took a few minutes to stop and work out a game plan. The length of my legs was still outside the entrance. They were just dangling there. The tomb was still big enough to move my head around and move my arms freely into position. 
It was larger than the rest of the passage, but not by much. It's like sticking your head into a box. If I ever looked, there were rocks that were not too far from my head. Any sound I made was muffled and dead. The nearest part of the passage was about ten feet in. At this point, it was about three and a half feet in. At the four-foot mark, I would have to commit to whatever position I felt comfortable and stay that way until the twelve-foot mark, at which time the case started opening up. I went with my left arm forward and headed towards the right. Uh, I turned to the right. B had given me a flashlight that I held my left hand. Inch forward, I would try to brush the loose rock away with my left hand. Somewhat sizzled, but there were a lot of rocks that Mr. could not move. Eventually, the first, uh, uh, first little bit of the crawl moved along fairly quickly. There was a little room above me to negotiate the passage. The walls started to close in around me. I had a few extra inches on each side of me. But the top of the crawl was getting very low. About the seven foot mark, I could feel the top rubbing on my back as it would arch. After another one and a half foot, I couldn't arch anymore. I just push ahead with my toes and pull with my forward arm. So it would be a good time to see if I could back out. China was pretty easy and gave me a lot more confidence. Still, I beat Ty, webbing to my feet just in case he had to pull me out. Uh, my neck was starting to get <coughs> sore from being cranked to the side. It was getting heavy, but to rest it, the only option was to lay it down on the broken rocks. It was painful, but I did it frequently. I was staring at the wall to my right. It was a mere four to five inches from my face. Well, I wasn't watching the wall. Either I had my eyes closed, which I sometimes do when I go through a tight spot. Or, I was shining a direction that did me any good. <clears throat> it was very quiet in the tomb, other than my own breath. It was really heavy from the effort it took to move. Thankfully... The breeze was present and cooled me off. By lifting my head and carefully touching the ceiling from time to time, I could gauge the size of the passage that my body would soon pass through. Much like a cat using his whiskers to uh, gauge an opening in the fence. At the seven and a half foot mark, I could tell things were about to get real tight. The only the in the passage jeep when the cave one is in a unique position to ponder. Matson literally resting on top of me, the entire earth lying below. Tiny moon and earth, and I would cease to exist. Or worse, to recognize the fear shared by Floyd Collins as he lay there, trapped for days with deep within the heart of Mother Earth, and capable of freeing himself from his earthen prison. Picture yourself in my position, lying on your stomach, your left arm extended over your head, your arms at your side having only a few inches in which to move. Your hands and arms are all sore and bleeding from crawling, such so as pulling yourself across a broken rock. Your entire body is resting on the rocks. Your neck is getting it's tired of holding your head off the rocks, so you gently rest your cheek on the rock to rest. Once you start again, you have to push your toes to scoot your body forward, sliding across the rock. If you moving a few inches, you're breathing out and have to rest. You know you can feel your back pressing hard against the top of the squeeze. Seven months before you're covering up to breast forward, the entire time you're lying there, you think about how you're going to get back out and what if. Oh, well, that's pretty much what I was going through at the point in the passage. Yeah, this would be a good time to throw in a picture of the squeeze. It was actually taking a different trip when it shows how tight things are at the point in the passage. My head turning to the side, not by choice. And now you can see how I rest my chicken on the rock. You can also see how difficult it is to look ahead of me. My arms are pinned to my side, I can determine that was the best position. There's virtually no space between the top of the pass and my back. Tight. Not for the last or claustrophobically inclined. Oh boy. When I reached <coughs> the point where my back was rubbing and I could feel with my head the passage was not getting bigger, I knew I was most likely not going to get through. So I decided to give it one more push. Have I been in this position a year ago? When I say a panic, but not today. I was pretty pumped. I took a few minutes to take a rest, and then I went for it. I exhaled completely all the air in my lungs. This caused my chest to collapse enough to scoot forward a few inches. Cause it takes so much effort to scoot. I went a few inches before I had to stop and breathe. As I kneeled, my chest pressed hard against the floor, and my back against the top. No longer to get my breath back. Unbelievably, I did it again. I exhale, scoot, rest again only a few inches. Pete took a few extra minutes to enjoy this position. Being in a small passage, wow, I could not believe how relaxed I was. Try one more time to exhale and scoop my back was rubbing too much to continue. Despite the failed effort, I was psyched. It took seven long minutes to lay there and recover from the effort. Pete encouraged me the entire time. <coughs> it was fun to hear him cheer as he saw my shoes go deeper and deeper in the hole. Banging out was not too difficult, but it did same, take some more. Can't say my muscles that when I went in. After I wriggled my hips out of the hole, it took some time. I had trouble getting my shoulders up. Both arms were over it at this point. I was getting caught on the rocks, and my shoulders were brushing the sharp rocks. So I'm finding a good position, I gave up and just pulled my outer body out. Scrape. Shirt pulled up on my hand, I had some nice scrapes on my shoulders, but I didn't care. To me, this trip was a success. I pushed myself beyond what I thought was possible. 
The only entrance looking in the inner passage I had just been in. The is now about at the 11 feet mark. I pushed it a little with my forward arm. Uh, the smallest point was at the 9 foot mark. We were close. Between the work and the time I was tired, I just sat on the little bag, grinning. Ooh, what a trip. This is a general introduction about the usual climb out, dinner, trip home, etc. Well, when we brainstormed, came with some ideas that you know, us get through. We both invented some tools to remove the rock floor deep within the passage. We were both very excited about this trip. I from pushing my limbs to the cave, and B from assessing climbing out of the cave. And this is the first time he was able to climb all the way out with the help of the time devices, nor my help. First look at that showed the progress he had made since the accident. Pretty cool. I remain amazed that we could so easily forget the terrifying moment we experienced just the day before. All been forgotten. The strange noise being blamed in our minds is some rational, harmless explanation. Success. April 7th, 2001. Prior to going back at the mystery cave again, we spent a long time preparing. Made a squeeze box, which is a wooden box with the opening that which can be just in size. Could then crawl through the opening measure to see how tight of a squeeze we could fit through. From that, we were able to determine that I need about 8 inches high to get through the smallest portion of Floyd's tomb. And we would have to scare out about an inch from the floor of the passage. And the best position I would need to get through the it would be on my stomach with my arms on my side. And of course, my head to turn on one way or the other. She allow my shoulder blades to to the lowest point. In order to move, I would push forward or backwards my toes. It sounds difficult, but it felt ad adequate. I made it prove to work sufficiently. Uh, the second thing we did to prepare was to construct tools we invented to work with in the cave. I came up with a clever way to chip inside, uh, way inside of the passage dive and to climb inside. I made it well together with several pieces of steel pipe in a manner that would allow us to take apart while um, we climbed down the tomb, but still have enough strength to hold up to a blow from a hammer once it was inside, once it was together. We made our own tips that uh, we could screw into a pipe when uh, I reached the area we needed to work on. B came up with a cool design for skipper using angle iron. He and his neighbor welded um, together. We made it prove to me a valuable tool for scraping and removing the rock. Both proud of our inventions. I also made advice why drill that attached to a pipe. You know, I'm not using it since B's scraper device worked so well. Um, here's a pipe uh, B added to the dining with the pipe we made. Took the picture facing away from the tomb. He's sitting in the bag we use as a bed. And I'm to his left of the passage that leads down to the silt water behind him. Is to right the last drop off before the passage. You can see some orange webbing. We used to climb down and up. Took an oath. I made a vow. I would not leave the cave until I made it to the passage conquered Floyd's tomb. This would be the trip. It's been a long time since we've been out to mystery. We have been busy though. Made the tools we talked about. It was fun coming up with other two ideas for tools. Also, we made a squeeze box to determine the best thing for getting through the tight spot. Plus, we knew how much rock we needed to remove before we get through. So, to get back to our cave and finish our project. Our climb down the passage took a little bit longer than usual since we had extra tools to carry. When we got, once we got down to the passage, we immediately got to work using B's scraping tool with the pipe we had made. It worked like a charm. Uh, you could hammer the pipe on one end, a skipping tool on the other end, dug into the rock. Then we could push the debris all the way through the passage and out of our way. When we needed to measure our progress, we would turn the scaper sideways and the passage and observe this clearance. We were for about two hours before I had a desire to try the tomb. So to make sure I was going to make it through on the first try, B made one more sweep of the passage floor, cleaning any loose rocks from where I would be crawling and pushing the wall we had made to the back of the squeeze. I prepared machines for the roll by fashioning duct tape suspenders to prevent my shirt from sliding around while I was sliding across a rock. And I went with a flash out of my hand even though my hand would be on my side. I knew I would need it once I got through. And in expression of faith, I did not tie a rope to my feet. I was confident I was going to make it. I finally made the attempt, although I didn't mention my journal. We didn't notice. Reese was back in the rumbling prison. Now you didn't do any work on the entrance, I had to go through the same dance routine to even enter the passage. Once I got my upper body through the hole, I shot my flashlight ahead of me to get a plan of attack. The passage didn't seem any bigger than the last time I was there. Most of the work was done deep in the squeeze. Passed for a few minutes and twisted my hips to get my lower body in. I slowly inched forward as my entire body slowly filled the passage. Before it was completely in, I got into position for the push. I dropped both of my hands to my sides and turned my head to the right. I made it inch forward. Once my toes were inside the cave, I used them to push forward to keep from skipping my body. I would walk in my shoulders, knees, and toes. 
Uh, progress was slow but steady. It was fine by me. Foot or two before the tight spot, I could already tell there was a little more room. So I began to touch the roof of the passage on my back. So I was going to continue moving forward. I reached the lowest part of the passage and I could tell it was going to, still going to be tricky. When I quickly done clearing out the loose rocks, I still felt sharp pebbles rolling into my chest as I slid along. When I could feel my back brushing the top of the passage in several paces, I reverted to my technique of exhaling. <coughs> Well, I'm beginning over, it took a minute to lay the passage. I could see the glow of bees flash it. Any light match squeezed past my body. I feel the cool breeze evaporate the drops of dirty sweat on my forehead. I could feel a thousand sharp edges digging into the surface of my skin. The twinge of excitement as I realized that the goal we had set up to achieve weeks ago was about to be realized. It's all only me want to keep moving no matter how tight the passage came. I breathed in and out rapidly for a few minutes and began. Exhale, scoot, stop to catch my breath, repeat. Just a few inches of scooting, I could raise my head off the floor. <clears throat> uh, the squeeze until the passage was beginning to open up. I really had permission to be, and we took a few seconds to celebrate. Another side to the passage, B was cheering me on. Virgin Passage! A Neil Armstrong territory where the phrase he kept repeating, I was grinning ear to ear. And even though the passage was beginning to get large, it was still slow going. I had to continue scooting along for another foot and a half. Before I could set my arms underneath it, me to use them to crawl. When I felt my journey was um, essentially over, I set up slightly and moved the rock wall we had erected several trips ago. The rock served as a summer reminder that a little caution would be wise. She back to B that I was through. When we both took a moment to congratulate ourselves on our success, B was likely never going to be able to see through the passage and see what I was seeing, so I got an inscription of the cave looked like. I only had my midi mag, so I could not see very far in the passage. <coughs> The passage made a gentle right. Generally right turn and seemed to go for a ways. I was able to do anything at this point but sit and do the sheer size of the passage. Do the size of the passage. All the broken rocks we pushed to floated stone were around me at this point. No other signs of human intrusion. I had to wait until B passed me my helmet like to get a bit feel for the cave. Me used the pull we made to side me the end of a rope, then I was able to pull all my gears through the squeeze. First thing you sent through was a helmet light. After I got my light fired up, I was able to see a new section of cave. Hours. Exciting experience to see the results of our hours of hard work over the course of several weeks. So I still had no idea what the cave had to offer. The only thing I could see in the passage immediately following the squeeze, it was a narrow passage with a low ceiling. I would be easily be able to get through it, but I would have to crawl. I began taking pictures so I could chill B. How I scroll up and it uh, scroll down, it goes up. <clears throat> um, I asked B how far he thought I could should venture in the cave. A lot of strange events had occurred. For the first time, T2 turned down the Susie and remember the noises. Pop through the tomb with a loosened tip on the edge. He said I could use it as a weapon if I ran into an animal, or he also told me to me to make sure we could hear each other that progressed into the cave. And though we were at least seeing the possibility of running into trouble, we never really considered the fact that if I got in trouble, B would never be able to rescue me. In fact, no one would be able to get to me for many hours. If we were in serious trouble, it was in Earth, there's no way anyone would be able to get to me in time. But, some by all experience, we were focused on our goal and not the potential dangers we faced. So far, we had dodged a very bullet. So far. <clears throat> I strapped on my gloves and knee pads, grabbed my camera, and began my adventure. Crawled through the passage, which was about 20 feet long. At the end of the crawl, Keep in slightly to the right, I would have to um, uh, climb up a gentle slope, but then I would be able to stand by the end of the, uh, end of the next session of the cave. The next section was about 40 feet long, in addition to having a higher ceiling, the walls were a little wider than the section I just crawled through. The section was relatively straight. The floor was covered in um, a uh, rock which crunched as I crawled and when I walked across it. Um, the walls are basically the same as much of Mystery Cave except pristine. So obviously no one had been there before me. Upon closer examination of the walls, I found two delicate types of formations. These are almost little chunks of grated cheese tied together on one end. The rest of the cheese just flopping down. So the formation was just tiny strands of rock, thinner than human hair. Pretty cool. I found several examples of both kinds of formations. Let's see. So what it looks like is, it looks like mica. And it looks like, um, sandstone, maybe? I don't know, honestly, it looks a lot like, um, insulation. Like, like, dirty, decrepit insulation, you know, it's orange. 
<clears throat> instead of white, uh, yellow. Anyways, um... Uh, I was not even through the second section of the cave. Could barely hear B. Caves passages are not very acoustically friendly. Should I uh, go for uh, half hour then return? That would be fine to be careful. And I proceeded to explore some more. Could walk nearly upright at this point. I was in the third straight section of the cave when I discovered a crystal formation on the wall to my right. It was in several layers in the wall resembling clear, clear candle wax. It was allowed to melt and drip down the wall. There were several small stalactite looking formations formed by these crystals, along as about four inches in length. And there would have been one much longer, judging by the size of the base, but it had broken off. I looked to see if I could locate where it ended up, but I couldn't find it. The passages continue on for another 100 feet or so before the cave opened up a little. Then I have a short, straight segment of the cave. At the very end of the segment, the cave made a bend to the left, went up into a room. Just at the point where the room began, there's a round rock that appeared to be leaning against the wall. This seemed odd. But same information are common case, so it's by no mean unique. If uh, I had crawled and stepped over several large chunks of rock that fell down from the ceiling, but this one was more round than the others. But as the rock, the uh, room opened up at about 15 feet, 15 feet in width and about 30 feet in height in length. At the far end of the room, there's another passage leading straight out. Another man, eerie feeling. It was like the old sayings that I felt like I was being watched. Seeing so excitement, the new find faded in the memories of the mysterious side of the cave. Get back to my mind. Suddenly, I felt very alone. Fortunate for me, Eagle, I was nearly out of time and I had to go back to be before my half hour was up. Still, so picture the room. I was going to just get a feel along the next passages when something caught my attention. The left side of the room on the wall was at about I love where I discovered what appeared to be hieroglyphics. Single drawing that appeared almost uh, just part of the rock coloration. It looked like a very crude representation of people standing below a symbol. I was pumped. I made another entrance cave, and the entrance was closed or blocked my main opportunity to open up and get B into the cave. I took another look at the drawing to make sure I could describe it to B, then I took some more pictures and ended back up to B. Right, got back to the excuse I could barely talk fast enough to let B know everything I discovered. She's just as excited to hear about our newly found treasures. We debated what our next move would be. I began to send my gear back to the tomb to B. It would be best if we got someone else to come back with me, in case anything happened. He agreed. Once I got all my gear through, I was faced with a wonderful task of having to negotiate Floyd's tomb again. Theoretically, a person should be able to get a passage he just crawled through by simply reversing what he did. Cut his body a certain way to get in, he should be able to get in the same position to get out. Apparently, this may not prove to be possible or practical, such as was the case with the tomb. I determined in advance I would attempt to go ahead first back to the squeeze. I knew that I could definitely make it by going feet first, that I mean backing up all the way through the tomb. It took a long time to be very exhausting. My only concern going at first was that uh, when I got to the end of the squeeze, I would have to go through the hole we had made, the benefit of being able to twist my body. Oh well. Just go ahead first and deal with the exit when I got to it. Sort of into the squeeze, very close to the tight spot, so at least I would have it over soon. I was choking through it, shift my hips to the right to get a little, a little to get through. Just kept plugging away at it. My hands were once again by my side. My head was turned to the right, and I was scooting with my toes. And once again, my head as a gauge tell when I was at the tight spot. When I was past it, I seemed to get tied a little quicker on the way out, and from all the work we had done to get through. A little over halfway through, when something bizarre happened. <coughs> I was laying there a brief break when I heard a sound deep in the cave. Same but a distinct sound of rock sliding a rock. My blood froze in its veins. I couldn't move. Just later, strange near the sound again, nothing. I didn't suit towards the exit. I didn't mention the sound to B, but I did recall one of her earlier trips. B said he heard the same thing. Again, the hole turned out to be as painful as I thought it would be. I laid my arms overhead and forced my shoulders through the hole. I definitely have some skin behind it to slip through. He helped me as I wiggled my upper body out of the passage. I catch myself and leave my lower body out of the tomb. I was out. Be nice, shook hands, and began a little bit gear. I was trying to listen to sound coming home, but we were making too much noise gathering our stuff. And as I look forward to getting to the passage, it's really to get back out. And that's pretty much how I feel about caves in general. It's going, but it feels, but I feel good when I get it back out again. Something strange happened with um. <coughs> Did I? Something strange happened with the pictures I took in the new part of the cave. Pictures I took in the passage leading up to the large room all turned out just fine. You know, the picture is taken in the room turned out. 
Pictures of Ron Rock and more importantly, pictures of the hieroglyphics I saw. Pictures taken before and after the room turned out great. Negative photos taken in the room were clear. Nothing. I remember what the hieroglyphics looks like. Drew pictures giving you an idea of what I saw. And it's a crude drawing of what I saw, but it's accurate. The first thing I thought when I saw was Blair Witch Project. Uh, it kind of has the same feel to it. The symbol was in the center. The figures that looked like people raising their hands were below this. And he has one of the round rock at the edge. Next. It's called Next. April 14th, 2001. A couple days last of our beef on someone who went to explore the passage with us. He told me he talked to a few other people who couldn't make it because of scheduling conflicts. They really grilled him for information on the cave and about the passage. I told him which cave it was to ensure that we explored it to our salvation before we made it known to the public. We ended up going with it, did not know which cave until we were very close to it. So wanted to secrecy that would not reveal the location of the cave uh, anyone on the planet. I don't have by name, so I'll just refer to him as Joe. Joe, B, and I set out early in the morning to make sure we could spend all the time we wanted in the new passage. When we got to the cave, we were able to rig up and descend rather quickly. Helps when you have to haul half a hardware store down into the cave. We were impressed by our work, even B and I took a moment to pat ourselves on the back for all our work we put in. The fact that we made it through, chose a rather thin cave with a lot of experience in caves. Said this might be the tightest squeeze he'd been in, but it didn't bother him. I knew that physically he would be able to make it since I was bigger than him and I made and I made it. So he excited us to get to the cave maybe more. We got ready and was waiting to hear what the planet attack was gonna be. I figured I would send him through first since he was ready I would fall. B would pass the gear through and wait for us outside of the passage. He was two hours to return, that was nice of B to go down the cave and babysit us. It's boring sitting there in the cave. With our plan set, we we're ready to roll. It was perhaps irresponsible as not to tell Joe about all the unexplained events that occurred in the cave after he had gone through. What exactly do you tell someone? How many weird things do we need to reveal to him? I feel that we were in any danger or not going to the caves ourselves. So we did not tell him a thing prior to him entering Floyd's tomb. Unless when he did tell him afterwards it was too late. I can't believe how easy Joe slipped to the basket. She said it was tight but it sure didn't look it. Um, once I got in, we passed him his gear, and he started in. Even though I knew that I could fit through, it was still a slow trip through the tomb. You go so fast when you're scooting with your toes. Shot a tight spot of the squeeze I had Joe snap a picture of me. We make a good photo. Once I got through, B started to relay my stuff to me. Then disaster struck. Got all the way in, turned around to pull my gear through. I had to kneel down, and <clears throat> still Christian alone. I had just taken a, got my helmet, ironically. And I was sitting around to feed the rope back to me when I smacked my head on the top of the passage. Human skull versus solid rock. Rock run. I mean, what happened? He sent my first aid kit through. I was bleeding, being worse. I didn't feel too good. I pushed myself up and then told Joe I didn't think I'd better continue. He looked like a little kid who was told that Christmas would be cancelled. Though I didn't like the idea of him exploring the cave without me for selfish reasons, of course. I didn't really see part of the cave for my making the trip out there. So how far to go and how long it would take. And I set him on his way. <coughs> and then out there I could hear some crawling in the darkness. His light disappeared after the first time. A minute or two then began my journey back to the squeeze. This is more to get all the way to the cave and not be able to explore it to the end. Actually, it's killing me. When I got to the void stone, which was painful, I uh, sat down munching a cliff bar while B and I chatted. Cliff bar owned by whoever owns them. Um, I told him I would pay for a motel room if he would stay overnight. And then we could see I was doing the next day and making another time in the cave. I felt goofy when I smacked my, cave, my head on the cave wall. So he was going to give another try to do more. He was just as anxious to put some closure to this cave. When Joe would stay overnight, we determined to wrap things up the next day. So we just sat back and enjoyed the darkness. Could hear no sounds coming from the passage. This man, it was a sign to remind me of the escaping noise that I heard last time we were out there. The subject would be, since I had not explored the cave completely, I could offer an explanation. What could be making an escaping noise or to change the wind strength of the rumbling? What well, a terrible scream we heard. Suddenly, you both wished we had not sent Joe into the cave alone. Oh, and yelled in it, Joe. No answer. Not be yelled at. Not surprising you just can't hear each other when you're very far apart in a cave. No main sounds, good sounds, that is, Joe type sounds. It's time limit we had set past in 20 minutes. I really had no desire to climb back through the squeeze. I was still throbbing the squeeze looked tighter than ever. Still, I knew I was going to have to make sure Joe was safe. Just as 
I was getting prepared to go back through, I saw a light deep in the passage. Joe, I called out. Nothing. Joe! Still in the mind. So the light got brighter and I could hear the noise of someone crawling across a broken rock that lined the cave. You okay, Joe? No. Was his weak reply. When he got to the other side of the tomb, he was not feeling well. He quickly took his gear off from the back so he could pull it through. As I pulled the back through the passage and climbed back through the tomb, he didn't even get a chance to question about what he saw before he was coming back through. He quickly slipped through the squeeze and the hole and we finally got a look at him. He looked terrible. He was pale and was out of breath. Dust that covers the floor of the squeeze left its mark on his face and clothes. He knew small cuts and scratches on the face and arms, probably from his rapid exit from the passage. His eyes were open wide. We only had a brief moment to look at the change that occurred to Joe before he started to head up and out of the cave without saying a word. Joe and B started to suffer the ticket man to get out of our gear. I stopped to listen to the passage and I heard nothing, and I felt nothing. When it stopped, Part of me wanted to get out of the cave as fast as possible, but another part of me wanted to immediately climb back through the passage to find what made this cave tick. Then was not the time, though. I still felt a little dizzy from my injury. When I was being Joe, I made good time getting up the cave passage and I was left alone. Chills ran through my body as I scurried up to catch with them. Once I got outside the cave, I figured we would be able to find out more from Joe. Yeah, but when he got up to the final climb, he just unclipped the rope and went straight to the truck. A lot of day, he looked even worse in the cave. I got up the rope and our gear and headed up for the truck. Just he did not want to stay overnight because he felt terrible and we believed him. And so we headed home. We could get no more information from Joe. He just stared straight at it. He was shaking like a leaf. He just said it was not cold. And I questioned him. His answer was short. He saw the hieroglyphics? No. Do you hear the yelling? No. Do you see around the rock? No. Do you see crystals? No. Just went in a little ways in and started to feel sick. Who was fishy about his answers? He would have had to have seen the crystals if he got far enough to the cave. Couldn't hear his yelling, but why would he not elaborate? Chip passing your sons, Joel didn't say much else. Every file and strange events happened in the cave, he didn't reply. Finally, off he asked if he wanted to go back in the cave, he shook his head and ran into his house. Home later in the day, the next day, but it all, only got his voicemail. Oh. Well, um, <clears throat> April 28th, 2001. In this journal entry, I discuss briefly <clears throat> the feelings of B and I had at this point. I would like to elaborate on those feelings and set the mood for this part of my journal. I can successfully convey our exact thoughts and feelings to be contemplated our next move. If not, I'm afraid we will appear to the average reader as being ignorant, naive, or downright foolish. This cave represented to us a culmination of weeks of hard work, complete with an array of emotions. From fatigue to fear, anticipation to pain, from frustration to glory, to us we were not standing at the brink of possible destruction, but rather honoring an unspoken commitment, much like a parent of a wayward child. We're not about to abandon our child or fear the unknown. Like it or not, this cave has become a part of us, and now we must see you that this adventure to its fruition. I should have both explanations of life we are being eaten alive with curiosity. The overwhelming number of unexplained occurrences we experienced we had to go back in this cave. Making the rumbling noise, what caused the change in wind strengths, etc., etc., all the way down to Joe. What could have possibly happened to him? What did he see or experience? We had many lengthy discussions about what our next move would be. We kept coming to the same conclusion we had to return to the cave. Could have no possible scenarios that would solve the many riddles we um, held deep within the cave. The only way we could hope to complete the puzzle would be to conquer the cave. We were going back to Mystery Cave. Two weeks after a trip with Joe and we were on our way back to the cave. To prepare this trip, we came down a little cave rescue group. Got permission to borrow their low voltage two way phone. One could do the two transceivers and a long spool of thin wire. I would then be able to unwind the wire as I went into the passage and stay in contact with B the entire time. Oh, it would be a good idea to take a video camera to the new passage. Press a case that would protect my video camera from dust, as well as sharp rocks. I was more than willing to pay the cost of the case just to make sure B got to see the entire passage. My head was doing fine. I saw a light red line to mark the spot where I tried to break the rock with my head. I never went to the doctor, but it was still a very painful experience. I thought about what would happen if I had been able to go to the passage with Joe. He was a changed man after we came out. I've been calling his house in the early every day trying to talk to him, but he won't answer his phone. Because work and a mutual friend told him that Joe called in sick two weeks ago and hasn't been in since. 
Joe Warner's boss he might be out for a while. I even stopped by his house twice. First time it looked like someone was home, but no one answered the door. The second time his car was gone, and there were no lights on. I hoped to talk to him before this trip, but it didn't work out. We were rigging up the rope to sit in the cave, and I felt something for the first time. I did not want to go into the cave. Not feeling foreboding, was not receiving some premonition. There's no desire to enter the underground world of Mr. Cave. She was feeling with B at the time, even though I had no desire in the cave, I knew we had to. So I double checked my gear, slipped over the edge of the little cliff. Um, right from the beginning, it seemed like the cave did not want us to be there. Nothing went smoothly. Every time we tried to clip a carbine and tie a knot, attach them to rope, we had to do it two or three times to get it right. We recognized this and made sure everything was safe and secure. As we. <coughs> We made our way down, we are continually bumping the side of the cave, so something as we walked or dropping things. We reached a point where we get stopped to get ourselves before continuing a little bit of light, taking thing forever to get to the hole, finally we made it. The camera and phone to make sure they survived the trip. Did everything and I gathered the gear. I wanted to take it into the passage. Then it was time. We took we looked at each other but uh, but said nothing. I faced the uh, passage. I just twisted my body and began entering the toe. I desperately hoped it would be the last time I would throw my body tender. His cla claustrophobe's nightmare. The trip through Florida's too went smoothly, figuratively speaking. After I got through, it took seven minutes to get everything passed through to me. I had suited up, tested all the equipment. The phone worked like a charm. <laughs> um, I videotaped the squeeze and the first section of the passage. Since I wouldn't be able to tape while I called my plan. Was a call to the next session and then stop filming some more. Video what I had just been through and then video what I was going to call through next. Then I could get each section from both ends. I was starting to feel pretty good about the trip. Then I had a sense of personal satisfaction of being able to provide a way for B to see the fruits of his labor. Awkward lurking the camera and rolling the phone wire while trying to crawl, but I knew it would be worth it though. Small information is too small to show up in the video. With normal outside lighting, it would be no problem, but my headlight is only so light that our effort was futile. <coughs> the relations turned out quite nice. And they were easily large enough and made for some pretty good footage. I had to film to stop to check the phone. It was comforting to hear someone's voice deep in the passage. The only thing that I unplugged the phone and prepared to continue. The phone resembled an oversized regular phone, more like the ones you would see in war movies. When I wanted to talk to B, I just plugged the phone into a special jack and spool of wire. I was supposed to be on B's end of the phone, so it was always turned on. Then it was as clear as a normal phone. Continue forward. You know, progress was so uh, as it was steady. Things were going pretty good until it reached Run Rock. I got, got a strange feeling, just like the last time. I carefully, but saw nothing to be alarmed about. I proceeded to film the entire room. Good shots of Run Rock from all angles. I got the walls, seeing the floor to my best ability. You even got some pretty good tape of the figure in the wall. I couldn't make out exactly what it was in the video, but you could definitely tell something was there. And I taped everything to my side of action and moved towards the end of the room to prepare to explore new territory. Part in the large room was eventually led to darkness. It was about a foot lower than my head, and it looked like it continued at the height for as far back as I could see. I ducked in the ceiling prepared to see new sights. The walls in the new passage were darker than the rest of the cave at this point. The floor was made up of uh, the same type of broken rock, same and same type of near perfect arch in the old section of Mystery Cave. It almost seemed out of place in the jagged atmosphere of a cave. And I could only see about 30 feet or so where the passage appeared to make a right hand turn. I thought it would be a good place to check in with B. He was a little beats before he answered the phone, but once he did, his voice was so crystal clear that he might have been snoozing. Having gone that long, I was doing fine, and I could take as much time as I needed. Thanked him and hung up. His patience has been wonderful during this whole project. He has spent a lot of time just waiting for me to go and explore the passage. He was still waiting, willing to sit and wait. Oh, the phone started to film the passage, and then it happened. From behind me. I heard the scraping noise. It was loud. It was close. In the large room I had just left. I wheeled around to face whatever made that noise. When I did, I lost my presence of mind and stood up at the same time. Crunch! My helmet crashed into the passage ceiling. My light broke and I was buried in heavy darkness. Pain shot through my neck and down into my back. And I protected my head, but my neck was nearly numb from the impact. Fear enveloped me and my knees began to weaken. I slowly and voluntarily sumped to my knees. I gently set the camera down and I was beginning to see stars and the pain in my upper back. The scary noise lasted only a second and now the only sound I could hear was my own panic-inspired breathing. Not only could I feel the fear thick upon my chest, 
not only seemed to hold me in place. I felt like I was vulnerable from every direction. I turned and looked behind me into the side of me and in front of me. Everywhere I looked, I saw black. Finally, I broke the super terror long enough to reach for and turn the light source to the mini mag on my helmet. I twisted the light to turn on. And when I did, I nearly cried. I forgot to put fresh batteries in. I could barely see more than a few feet. Still, it was better than nothing. Then I began shining the light with all my might into the large room and strained to get a glimpse of any movement in the room. Nothing. I was shaking violently as I sat there trying to figure out well, what to do. My mind was not thinking clearly. I honestly thought I was going to die right there in the cave. For the moment, I wanted to be whatever figure out what had happened to me. It hit me like a boulder. The phone! My mind must have been cleaning up at that point because I also thought about the glow sticks. Then I was off to a large room. I yeah, um, felt around my pack for the glow sticks. I came to the phone can I video camera and moved as much as possible from my pack, and the only thing I left would be was my backup headlamp. Thus, I was left with only glow sticks. I found one and ripped it out of the package. I could tell something was wrong by how it sounded. It had been inadvertently broken and was now useless. I checked the ground and searched my pack for another one. I my eyes out of the large room and only checked the past behind me occasionally. And the glow stick broke it to light it up. Soft green glow created eerie colors in the walls of the cave. Stick provided barely enough light to see the media area and provided no hint of what light I had. Alright, for one more light, again, I'm gonna take my. Yeah, um, <coughs> my eyes out the room. I felt the third glow stick and ripped it out of the pa package. Breaking it to make sure it worked, I hesitated and threw the glow stick into the large room. Perfect one of the stick sailed through the length of the room. In the brief moment the light traveled through the room, I saw nothing but cave wall. If anything, usually did nothing to ease my state of panic. At the. <coughs> And, uh, far in the room, I got a brief glimpse of the round rock, the light bounced on it. And the light went beyond the rock and seemed to disappear. I was still shaking. But, at least I didn't see anything. Still, there was a noise. I used the glow stick to light the phone reel, and with fumbling fingers, I managed to plug my phone in the jack. I put the phone in my ear and heard nothing. Using the gate connection with the phone were not there. I pulled the phone from the jack and used it, and again, silence. The line was dead. What could have happened? I just talked to B. I found myself nearly sobbing with fear. I knew the only way—I uh, found the only—I knew the only way out of here was back the way I came. But something was there, and to make contact with B met with the same results. I tried to think of another plan. But I could only focus on the memories of the grinding sound I heard. We can see I sumped on the inside of the passage, breathing like I could just finish a brace. Never raking eye contact with the shadows of the large room. <clears throat> and my shoulder touched the wall. I felt a powerful jolt of pain remind me. Collision of the roof of the cave. Despair, agony, terror. I couldn't say exactly how long away. I sat there, but my feet were tingling, my knees were sore. My back crept lower, although my neck felt no different. I was off to make an attempt to exit this evil passage. I knew if I waited too long, I would lose what little light I had. I didn't stand, but I did not have the strength. I crawled slowly to the near end of the large room, dragging my pack beside me. In the walls of the cave, I was able to slowly stand, though not straight, due to my sore back. Still breathing rapidly, I slowly advanced to the room. I wound up the phone while as I went. My eyes were starting to staring straight ahead, straining for any sense of movement. Every step, my light would cast ever-changing shadows on the wall, keeping me busy trying to look at everyone. The burns of the rails I had not burned blinked for many minutes. How many? How long had this been going on? The sounds I could hear was the crunch of my feet on a broken rock and the wheezing of my breath. From the court, I could hear the squeak of the wheel. We each turn bring me closer to the tomb, closer to the beat, closer to safety. Her tri trip through the room took an eternity. As I passed through the crude drawing, it seemed to glow as if offering some sort of warning. I don't know what the drawing represented, but everything with this cave seemed to instill fear. Well, the far in the room, I could see the um, round rock dimly at the far reach of my light. I seemed different about it, but I couldn't tell what. Within a few feet, I could finally tell what happened. It had moved. That was the sound I heard. Again, the terror gripped my entire body as I realized how close I was to something. I know it just been continuous, so it was not easy. I inched forward the rock, holding glow stick ahead of me in my shaking hands, using it to be just the darkness. I stopped just this side of the rock, another the sack in the phone wire, then I realized why I lost contact with B. When I was sitting in the wire, I gave it a tongue, and the thin wire snapped. No contact with the outside the world ceased to exist when the wire broke. I felt so alone and helpless. Even within the earth, I had voluntarily descended into my own grave with a casket of solid rock. With the phone now useless, I set it down in the passage, my gaze fixed on the round rock. Proceeded forward, my breathing was rapid, my throat dry and aching, my mouth dusty. Every crunch of the rock below my feet, my heart seemed to stop. 
No movement could be seen in the green glow of my stick. Got to the rock and peered over the top. Seeing nothing, I took several rapid steps past it. To the other side, I recoiled in horror at what I saw. The passage near the floor was a hole. Nah, with another passage revealed, it had been covered by the rock, but now it was exposed. The rock could not have moved by itself. <coughs> um, I backed away from the hole and collided with the office wall. I had not been paying attention to being my back. And it came back to me with all my f in all its fury. Started down the newly discovered passage. I went down at a 45 degree angle. He was straight for as far as I could see. Several feet down, I could see the glow stick that I had thrown. Um, it illuminated the passage enough that I could tell the walls were fairly smooth. In the same way, unlike the rest of the cave. It was about three feet in diameter, as far as I could see. It could have been an easy passage to explore. I had the least desire to do so. Right now, I want to out of the cave into daylight. So I backed away from the wall toward B. I never took my eyes off the abyss. When I tripped over the phone wires, I turned to leave this devil's there. I noticed my mini mag was practically dead, leaving me only with a glow stick. I spent the fully assumed to see another human would help to alleviate some of the fears I experienced. I went from the large rock and all I felt an overwhelming sense of panic fill my soul. It's like a legion of demons was about to attack me from behind. I felt like my salvation lie ahead of me in the darkness, and Lucifer was behind me, trying to keep me from safety. I found myself moving much faster than I should have been in that cave. My only thought was to get out as quickly as possible. As a close formation, barely even noticing the beautiful creation of nature and the green glow of my light. Every time I ducked to avoid a rock, I felt my back scream if I, it's reminded of my injury. I got to the point of the passage where I had to crawl. I flung myself down on four, four, all fours, barely slowing down as I dropped. When my hands came in time with the cave floor, I felt an electric shot shoot all the way down my back and someone sitting in my arm. Suddenly, as I began, I let out a scream. Crumbled down and lay there on a rock with new levels of pain manifesting every time I inhaled. Whimpering from fear and panic, uh, pain, I tried to listen to any other noise in the cave. I could feel the silence pounding my head. I knew from previous trips that B was still out of earshot, but I was close. Uh, forcing myself to move, I winced as I pulled my body on all fours and I progressed along the cave. I still held the glow stick in my hand, but it ceased checking me on me. Focus was at me. I reached a point where I could yell to B, but I didn't make a sound. I wanted to stop long enough to talk. Finally, I reached the... Last stretch of K before the squeeze. It's coming down at the beginning of the tomb. I called the B. He answered back. I screamed to him to get everything ready to go. He asked if it was okay. He answered for me on the phone since uh, he got in worry. I told him no. Again. I got everything ready to go. And then I reached the rope. I flipped off my helmet and shut in my pack. For some reason, I had forgotten my video camera. Flea thought I cared no more about the camera than the passenger that cared about a hat or coat. I tied on the pack to the rope and told him to pull it through. I told him to start into a service soon as he pulled the rope through. That's why I screamed that there was something in a cave with us. My back ached with every move I made. I knew it didn't matter, though. I didn't get through the tomb as fast as I could, injuries notwithstanding. Just as I started in the cave, I felt the wind in the passage increase. With it, the most nauseating stench I had ever experienced. It smelled like damp, rotting, rancid, putrid death. It smelled like a dry heave. I pulled my shirt up over my nose to shield me from the overpowering the smell. My beast smelled too. He yelled, "What is that?" He yelled me to hurry up and get through. I told him I was coming. I took a deep breath. My shirt and started back through. Bees yelling into my fear. I didn't need any help. I knew I could sense the urgency in getting in this place. Still, as I worked my way through the, uh, I yelled at him to start up. Then I would catch him when he got through. I said he would. He placed my glow sticks under the passage. And then I um, began to climb out. Science and squeeze, I had no regard for the tightness of the passage. I was scraping my face, ears, arms, and shoulders. Reaching the past squeeze meant numerous scratches on my body, but I barely noticed them. My back was nearly paralyzing me with pain. <clears throat> Once again, I felt the rising need to vomit because the odor being delivered to my nostrils by the breeze. <coughs> Halfway. To Floyd's tomb, I took a breath to ca a break to catch my breath. Approaching exhaustion, and my respiration rate was through the roof. And on top of the passage, seemed to re rest my cheek, and the floor felt like broken glass on my opposite cheek. Pounds briefly to recover air, the escaping noise coming from deep in the cave. For several seconds in silence, I let out a cry which shelled me. I was no longer conscious, reacting to the noise. The cry was subconscious in response to the fear which flowed through my entire body. In a panic, I scooped the passage. I reached a large part of the tomb. I quickly slid my arms on the body to get a position to exit through the hole. Then I opened and pulled with all my might. When my shoulders reached the hole, they lodged and I was stuck. I dug my feet into the rocks and wiggled my way back into the passage. 
My body slightly and tried again. This time I was successful in pulling my upper body through. I never carefully worked my way out since it was a three foot drop on the outside of the hole. This time I kicked with my legs, pulled them with my arms, and plop! And I dropped out of the tomb right under my shoulders. I tried to roll to stop the impact, but I was unable to do anything more than take the blow. Strangely, the pain was focused on my shoulder, apparently not affecting my already sore back. I rolled <coughs> over on all fours and slowly rose to my feet. It was much less intense as of the passage. I grabbed the glow stick and used it to find my helmet. I began to head for the webbing, climb up while um, strapping on my helmet. When I got the webbing, I reached up to grab hold and recall an oar. In the glow of the glow stick, I could see for the first time the injuries my arm. My arms were covered with deep cuts and scrapes. My arm was covered with blood. The wounds were not deep enough to bleed freely, but rather oozed the blood. In that brief moment that I stopped, I noticed that there was silence in the cave. No sounds coming from the passage. Really from up ahead. Once again, the feeling being alone returned, motivating me to proceed. Now that the little drop off proved to be difficult in my position. Um, having the glow stick as the only life source added to the challenge, even though you have the helmet. Um, once on top, I scrambled in, uh, to catch the bee. I was impressed with the speed of his ascent. I didn't mention any more of the physical condition during my exit, I was hurting. So I took pain shot through my lower back and neck. <coughs> I was just my shoulder with a nice gash in it. I honestly believe that if it were not for the terror I felt at the time, I would not have the energy and motivation to climb out. I'm in pure drill. Unfortunately, the drilling surge was about to end. I did not hear, or I did not see or hear B until I reached a small area at the bottom of the drop. I rolled climbing out as fast as he could. I could hear him moving out quickly and breathing heavily. Another I minute, mean, his reaction told me he was nearly as tense as I was. So we get on the rope and start climbing. We both knew it would be dangerous, not something we wouldn't ever normally do. It was different. And I stood there looking up where the rope would disappear in the darkness above me. It danced around as B made his way to safety. It was out of sight, but I knew it was close. I knew the rope was my lifeline to that side. It's light, safety. Beyond me was darkness, fear, the unknown. I had the fleeting thought of a movie scene where the actor had outwitted the monster and reached the front door of the haunted house. The creature the knob ears, the sound behind him, and turns only to see. I slid the glow stick into the coat of my helmet and reached my harness. And then I thought I would let B get a little bit higher when I pulled the rope up that was stretched down to the caves. Make it easy to get out once we got to the top of the drop. I chose not to wind the rope around my arm since it was sore and bleeding, so I just pulled it into a pile on the floor. From above, I heard B warm me rock and I ducked on the ledge and several small rocks on the floor near my feet. Then I went back to pulling the rope in. I was about half um, of it in. Fifty feet when the rope hit a snag. Ugh. It was solid. There was no way I was going to crawl back in and release it. So I just forget the rope and get my arms on and get out of the cave. I moved through the arms around me and started to buckle it before I could secure it. I had a string joins in my feet. My pulse began to quickly and I looked down on my rope. I discovered to my horror the rope was disappearing down into the darkness. Something was pulling the rope back into the cave. I let go of the harness and began clawing my way up the rope. Um, the unbuckled harness fell to the floor. Fortunately, held on to an ascender. Uh, at the moment, I could not think straight and began climbing the cave without being attached to the rope. I climbed my mouth many times while using the ascending device, but it was always attached to the rope just in case. I was climbing as fast as my battered body could hold me up. I was in a mere panic to sit again, and consequently was scraping, bumping, and gouging my arm and leg. Um, as I climbed, I screamed to be that something was pulling the rope. He yelled back to hurry up. Huck was with me in that I didn't slip or fall back down into the hole. Had I would have bounced several times against the side of the cave before smashing onto the floor. Injuries would be fatal. Not necessarily having to stop to slide the center of the rope, I made excellent time getting up. I could see rays of light above me come from the entrance of the cave. That told me exactly where I was in the cave. I got up to be on the ledge below where Rebelay Point was fixed. Um, I told him to keep going. It will only take him a few minutes. The second one will be torture. Then I wait for him to get up. I watched the rope that we just climbed and expected some creature from deep within the earth climb up make me its lunch. I moved around a bit in rhythm with bees climbing, but I did not have any tension in it. Still there waiting for a bee, I kept watching the rope for any signs of anything bizarre. I didn't know my heart could take any more stress. I could not have been more wired. I tried to relax a bit more to make sure I was thinking rationally. My poor brain had reached sensory overload. So you reached the top of the last climb, I got ready to clip on my center and get my sore butt out of there. As then I noticed the rope began to tighten from below, I could feel the tension in the rope. There was a steady tension, not like something, uh, not like someone was climbing up. The way I wanted it out of there as fast as possible. I clipped on, scrambled with the rope. I had noticed, but B had kept on moving toward the entrance. I got up the last few feet in a hurry, just unclipped and kept moving, leaving the rope behind. Then I got to the entrance of the cave in daylight, B was almost up to the where the rope was anchored. 
I wanted to get up so bad I almost started free climbing without clipping onto the rope. The wheel was almost up, so I clipped on and started up. I almost didn't make it up. I just started up when I nearly collapsed from exhaustion. I could enough to pull myself up the last few feet. As I climbed up, I could hear the tension of the rope manifest itself by a stretching noise in the rope. I prayed the rope would not break with me attached to it. The second then I reached the top, I ankled the sender. I could see B kneeling down by the tree, and over to him and collapsed. For the first time since I went through Floyd's tomb, we could see each other. We just stared. I knew it looked pretty bad, but I didn't know that B was in such a bad shape. Cuts and scrapes on every exposed surface of his body. His face was pale, almost white. His mouth and eyes were wide open. He was breathing heavily, almost gasping. Shock we shared at the other person's appearance was broken when we heard the rope around the tree stretch, not be a tied tighten. It was frozen in place. One of the bees seemed to be transfixed on the knot, then in one motion, he used a pocket knife and began to work on the rope. It's amazing how a person's state of mind can alter perception of time. I'm sure it only took four or five seconds to sever the um, rope from the tree, but it seemed like an hour. When the rope was cut, the knot fell to the ground while the end of the rope zipped across the rocks and over the edge of the cliff. The speed of it causing a humming noise as it went. When the rope was cut, B let out a cry. He dropped the knife and fell backwards. The rope fly over the edge brought the feelings in the passage to me. I got up, headed toward the truck, and B was still laying there, wide-eyed, staring at the point the rope disappeared. Come which seemed to break his trance. He got up, hurried away from the tree, the cave, the nightmare. He never said a word all the way home. Now, four days after the um, trip to the cave, it's taken me four days and done an attempt to get this entire experience written to my journal. So I started to write and recall the terrible feelings I had and couldn't write anymore. I felt compelled to continue so as to document unbelievable events while all the details were fresh in my mind. I can still feel the pain, still smell the stench, still experience the terror. Typing from my journal has taken hours. I would like to write more, but I we will have to wait. Even now, with several days between me and the event, I can't relax. I can barely concentrate. That's all for now. Five, um, May 19th, 2001. It had been three weeks since I last visited the cave. I want to update everyone as to my condition, my plans for the cave, and the events in the past few days. Pleasure for not returning your phone calls. I've been getting all your messages. I just haven't fell up to calling back. Steve and Mark, thanks for your words and encouragement on AI my answering machine. Two are sincerely concerned for me, you're awesome friends. Mark, I know you stopped by the house a few times, so I never answered the door. It really helped me knowing you just dropped by. Sis, hear the way in your voice, I'm okay, don't worry, my way. Just take care of those nieces and nephews of mine. I figure if I can get the site updated, I can let everyone know at once about how I'm doing. This happened in the last three weeks, so I'll do my best to cover everything. I should start where the last entry left off. It took several days to get the last journal entry written down. I was so shook up from the experience, I could do little else but sit around and ponder what had happened. Right now, I am on long-term medical leave from work. So I got to work several days after the event, but my boss sent me home. I couldn't concentrate and I looked terrible. We went to the doctor, but I couldn't tell him about the experience, so I just told him I was under a lot of stress. He recommended rest and gave me a prescription to help me relax. Mmm, good drugs. When we left that cave, I was nearly in a state of shock. I could not think clearly and I was having a difficult time trying to understand what had happened. I didn't eat much or nor did I get any sleep. I was glad I had the presence of mind to write down my experience when it was fresh in my mind. Reread what I wrote, I felt like I accurately portrayed what happened in the cave that day. I wouldn't change anything I wrote. And even though it took three days to write it, when I finished writing my, my journal, I felt much better. I guess it was kind of therapeutic. <clears throat> Fortunately, it didn't last. In fact, it was after then that things got really bad. I had a part of company after the trip, and I didn't see him again until yesterday. I didn't try to reach him, and he didn't try to get a hold of me. Nor did any either of us try to contact Joe. B just dropped me off after the trip in the next several days by myself in my house. Me, but I had no appetite. I was restless. I couldn't find anything to do to take my mind off the experience. That's when I determined that I should write it down. As I mentioned, that helped me to think a little clearer, and uh, I seemed to be a little calmer, but it didn't last. I worked the next day, but sent home. The day after that, I had an overall feeling of anxiety sink into my soul. Depressing confusion and no one I wanted to turn to for comfort. And all kinds of phone calls from people, but I just let the answer machine take the calls. Even change the messenger machine to let everyone know I was alright. Even here in this miserable state, eating and sleeping whenever I could manage. So we get the trip, then things start to get strange. Seeing the sounds in the house, they had no explanations. Footsteps, shuffling noises, creaking doors, you know, the typical horror, horror movie fare. Only the sounds were not distinct. I was as though I wasn't sure I heard what I thought I heard. I would be eating or getting out of the shower and stop thinking I heard something. 
but the sound would not repeat itself. In fact, if it weren't for the fact that it happened frequently, I couldn't be sure there were any noises in the first place. Either way, I was scared. It was as though I had been caught in a spiderweb for the last week. Feelings of anxiety, foreboding, tension filled my life. Then came the hallucinations. I began seeing things in a manner similar to the sounds I was hearing. Just a glimpse of something caught my eye, then I want to turn to look nothing. Sleeping with the lights on my room, but now I kept all the lights in the house on from before dusk to after dawn. <clears throat> when I then I saw when I started seeing things on a regular basis, I purchased a gun. Got it from Anna in the paper, so I didn't have to wait for a permit. Went to the doctor, but I didn't mention the details of my life. Just told him I couldn't relax, and I walked out there with a prescription. Fortunately, my wounds and injuries are pretty much healed by this time. My back still hurt a little. Prescription took care of that too. I was on the medication, and I felt great, but I didn't want to walk around high the rest of my life. Let me take it at the end of a tough day. Unfortunately, this very sim sightings increased, giving rise to a need for the medication. Then I should have my eyes continued, but then I began to see shapes and shadows. It would be outside my windows, usually at night. I still couldn't make out anything solid, so it was hard to pin down what I was seeing. Soon, I began to close all of my drapes and blinds so I could remove the possibility of seeing something. Doing so did help in that respect, but my life was still a mess. My daily routine was mechanical and empty. Sleep in as long as I could, usually had exhaustion. I would get uh, cleaned up and try to eat something and lost a lot of weight, so I tried to get as much as possible down me. Then I experienced a little nap a lot. I've only been out of the house a few times in the last two weeks. Store the doctor the gun purchase. I didn't watch much TV because I couldn't concentrate. A lot of time on the internet, I was doing wisdom caves and cavements. So what I could find was a cave of folklore about the hodag. Hodag is supposedly a creature that roams caves. <coughs> Two weeks after we went in that cave, and a week after I began hearing things, I began to have nightmares. Extremely lucid nightmares. No specific thing or recurring event, just plain terrifying. Sometimes I was in my house and someone was trying to get me. I couldn't run because I had no legs. Another time I was in a vat and someone was pouring a syrup-like liquid on me, filling the vat. Wake up in panic, I would stay awake until exhaustion forced me into the dreamland once again. A brutal routine. I continued for several days until I reached climax on the sixth day yesterday. My dreams seemed so real I had a hard time telling if I was awake or not. I was beat, really drained of energy and spirit. Going from the living room to my bedroom in the early evening when I looked in the hall and saw a dark figure toward the end. I was a thief at the bank at the back of slowly didn't move. I have the lights flickered on and off. Every muscle was tense. So the figure just in the phone ring. It was so bad I stumbled over the chair. I got up, I wheeled around to look down the hall and nothing was there. I grabbed my keys and left the house. I felt compelled to get in the car and drive. My pulse pounded in my temples as I got in and started the car. I wanted to drive to Overlook Point to see the city lights. I didn't know why I needed to go there, but I knew I had to go. I got the more and the feeling. When I arrived at the point, I saw something that first startled me. Uh, but then it caused me to be more relaxed than I had been in a long time. Joe was there. I was car standing looking at the lights. We looked at each other, I could see from the entire look of his face, we went through the same miserable trial that I've been experienced. You could tell from the look of my face that we'd share the same terrible experience. The conversation would be brief. You been back? You began even though he knew the answer? Yes. When you returned. Tomorrow good, I asked? Yeah, noon. And I was car and I got in mind, I didn't even want to talk to him about his experience. Obviously he didn't want to know mine. We were at the B's house. In the door I thought that be actually looked like he was doing fine. Somewhat happy. I mean as his vision changed, your conversation was almost succinct. Rich Joy and we're going back in tomorrow at noon. He looked dead serious. He just announced that I asked him if I could spend the night at his house. He let me in. I didn't notice until later, but every light in his house was turned on. Into his spare room. Help yourself. Thanks. I uh, washed her in the bathroom, took some medication, got the first decent sleep in a long time. I woke early in the morning, came home to get ready for the trip. I thought I would send out this update so no one would know what's going on with me. But uh, by the time I read this, I'll be back home and have a great story to tell. Uh, sir, if you haven't heard from me by now, you will very shortly. It's now 10 a.m. on Saturday the 19th. We'll be leaving the cave in two hours. I'm preparing for this trip will be no, like no other trip I've been on. For the first time in my life, I will carry a gun into a cave. So carry a knife and extensive the first aid kit, plenty of food and water, and a camera. Take several sorts of light and a pad of paper and pencil. I'll have to take all my climbing rope and be lost his in the cave. I uh, will carry a good length of rope with me on the other side of Floyd's tomb. It's the first time three weeks I've heard any references to Floyd's tomb since she was on my spine just typing it. <clears throat> so many things I hope to accomplish this day. So many answers I hope to find in a tiny passage hidden from view. Reflecting on the um, events leading up to today leaves me feeling dizzy. What? Was this all a bad dream? Fortunately, I'm wide awake and still in a few short hours I might face my nightmare. Having another person moving passages is nothing to leave with the fear I feel. 
Let's check out the upon a challenge notion that we have to consider. We went to the tomb first. Well, who will lead the way into the dark unknown? So then when we turn back, foremost among the questions in my mind is, what the video camera they left behind? It's supposed to be able to record complete darkness. The thing running, so we'll have fun of the tape. Dark questions follow. The camera's gone. What if it was destroyed? Well, it's difficult to put an exact name of a gay motivation. I think closure fits quite nicely. You'll find out a few things about this cave. The main thing, believe it or not, is to find that in the cave. With all the bizarre things I've witnessed these past few weeks, it would seem a bit trite to want. The primary goal to get to the end, but that's what I want. To be sure, I'll be seeing other bits of knowledge along the way, however. I find the end to the main passage and an end to the passage in by the rock. I will come be content to never return to the passage of the cave again. Never. It would seem to me that crawling at first through the tight passage in the darkness is an unnatural thing. The crawling up the side of a cliff for recreation. Jimmy, a perfectly good airplane floating to the ground. <clears throat> you seems to satisfy your hunger for adventure. This subconscious desire to conquer our own little Everest. The bee is fond of saying, Came in this last opportunity for exploration for the person with modest means. True. Short do drive from just about anywhere in the country is a cave waiting to be explored. A cave well known among the general public can be approached by someone for the first time as an adventure. Something new, something will come because it's there. Maybe you don't agree with my decision to pursue this cave. I know this from the message I receive. I'm afraid I don't have a choice. If I'm ever to experience restful slumber, I must return. If I'm ever to walk the halls of my own home in peace, I must return. If I'm ever to exit the overworld and enter the subterranean world of a cave, I must now return. I no longer feel that I have a choice. I must return. Family and friends are reading this, I say, be at peace. I will conquer this cave. I will return up to this website immediately. Include any pictures you take in the cave today, and if you stop by the house, I will show you the video I will have. You have to be home later tonight or tomorrow at the latest. So all of you soon, with lots of answers. Love, Ted. Then that is the last entry in the cave page. Hitting next simply puts you to the top.